Hi, and welcome to the 21st in our Middle Eastern Islamic history series. And today we're going to talk about the Safavid Empire. Um, just some rules for those of you who are not as familiar with our group. Um, I am not an academic, um, nor is my guest speaker, Rob. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that um, later in the presentation. And by that, I mean that I'm not accredited in history, religion, society, or any other discipline that would be the correct discipline to give this from uh, an academic uh, bibliographic perspective. I'm, I'm a lay person that's relatively well informed on these matters, but I also wanna say that I'm gonna give a secular presentation, right? It's not gonna be oriented in any particular religious doctrine or perspective. It's gonna try and give sort of a universal view of history. I have my own personal biases, but I'm gonna to try to do as best as I can to minimize those. And of course, like every other history topic, there are going to be points that are a little bit more contentious. So um, I just ask that we uh, follow Will Wheaton's law of uh, being respectful and taking these topics very seriously. In that vein though, I believe in an interactive presentation. So please, if you have questions, comments, clarifications, concerns during the presentation itself, um, please feel free to say them or to put them in the comment section. I do read the comment section during the presentation. So if you put something there, I will see it and I will respond to it. Um, this presentation is going to be what I call a 101 and a 201. And a 101 means that I cover the basics. I try to explain things in as simple as I can to sort of get you into a headspace where you understand everything. And a 201 means that if you know all of that, I'll still teach you something, right? So I'm teaching at both, I, I at least try to teach on both levels. Um, there's going to be a two hour hard stop, meaning that if it comes to two hours and we haven't covered everything that we wanna cover, that's okay. We'll just continue uh, with what with where we left off next week. You don't have to worry about, you know, do am I gonna stay an extra hour? Is there something more after two hours? That's, that's it for the presentation. We might entertain a few more questions, but um, the actual presentation itself will stop. And, this is a recording. So like the other 20 uh, le lectures or presentations in this series, you can go to the YouTube channel at omnicarta.org or uh, on youtube.com uh, to see all the prior recordings. Now, as I said, we are incredibly fortunate today. Um, a really good friend of mine, Rob Shamir, has decided to um, collaborate with me on this presentation. Uh, Rob is uh, Iranian uh, of Iranian stock himself. He grew up in the States and he works for a number of NGOs um, that have gone around uh, working with weapons maintenance and control around the world to keep us uh, safer, an incredible career. Um, and uh, we're, we're really lucky that he's here to join us. All right, so normally there would be a quiz, right? But since we've been away for the holidays and uh, to sort of get us back into the space, I figured that it might be a little bit better if we go through a review, right? So we remember that at the end of the 14th century, beginning of the 15th century, we had the empire of Timur, uh, uh, of Timur, known in the West as Tamerlane. And Tamerlane conquered a vast swath of area. You can see on this map, the areas that are in green, the areas that are sort of um, light green, tannish, all of those areas were under his control. And that includes this area called Iranian Azerbaijan. And it's important for us to distinguish this region um, because the country of Azerbaijan that exists today is north of the Aras River, right? It's in the historic kingdom of Shirvan, but um, Iranian Azerbaijan is the northwest part of the modern country of Azerbaijan. Uh, sorry, the northwest country of the modern country of Iran. And so uh, that's where a lot of the events in the early part of this history are gonna take place, right? This is where the city of Tabriz is, um, where you have the southwestern coast line of the Caspian Sea and the closest direct exposure to the Anatolian Peninsula, right? Coming from, coming from the West. Um, and that would be the Ottoman Empire once we move forward a little bit in time. So one other thing that we need to sort of reiterate is what are the external boundaries of the religion of Islam, right? Um, if we go back to our first lecture, we talked about that Islam has a number of beliefs that are associated with it in addition to the five pillars. And um, two of these 
belief sets are sort of strained or con- uh, or con- or constraining, perhaps we could say, to the development of different philosophical doctrines within the religion. The first one um, is rather simple, and it's this principle of Tawhid or unity. Um, and in Tawhid, there is only one God, right? That God is a being that is omnipotent, that has no corporeal form, is unknowable, um, and is timeless, right? all of these attributes very similar to the Jewish conception of God and similar to the Christian conception of the Father. Um, Now, the fact that God is non-corporeal, timeless, unknowable, makes it that God can never be a person who interacted with history in the form of something, right? He can interact with history through his godliness, right? But he can't interact through an avatar, or a a person or an animal, right? He can't do sort of Zeus games, right? Where he, where he uh, copulates with uh, people by turning into animals. God is, God is constrained in this way in Islamic philosophy and theology uh, to being something ethereal. The second um, concept is what is called uh, Zahiriya um, or Zahiriya, which means that the things that are said in the Quran about God, the things that are explained about the universe in the Quran are meant to be understood in the way they are written. And it seems rather intuitive that this is a natural process, but it's really not because in a lot of cases with religion, especially when you go into mystical doctrines and esoteric doctrines, you start to get readings of of the text that are fundamentally different than what the text literally says, right? And this internal meaning or Batin became a dominant core in a number of different heterodox groups, right? This idea that the world that we see and the Quran that we engage with as Muslims, right? I'm talking, if pretending I'm a Muslim, right? This Quran that we're engaging with as Muslims is not telling us the nature of reality, but it is instructing us through signs, symbols, and portents about the true nature of reality, which is not on the page. And it's not on the page because it's not intended for everyone. And I put up this picture of the matrix because I think that that sort of visually illustrates this sort of mental conception, right? When Neo sees this hallway with all of the computer code, he's seeing the true reality of the matrix, the reality that most of the inhabitants of the matrix cannot see. And yet he's, and because of this, he's able to understand the matrix at a level that the people within the matrix cannot understand it. And even the fellow agents and and humans and whatever who who are plugged in can't see it the way he sees it. This true seeing is what's called Baltiniya. And in Sunni Sunni orthodoxy, the Asharite uh, theology, and in Shiite orthodoxy as well, both of these are heavily circumscribed. More circumscribed in Sunnism than in Shiism, but both of these are heavily circumscribed. So, but what happens during the period of the Timurid state is that in this area of Iranian Azerbaijan, we develop a number of heterodox religions that sort of push at the boundaries uh, of these two ideas, right? This idea of Tawhid, of unity of God, and this idea uh, that God cannot be physical uh, and that he's one, and this idea that the Quran itself is not representing the literal nature of the universe, but is instead a signpost to the true spiritual nature of the universe. And this sort of divides in two ways. Uh, One we saw was Hurufism, um, which was this movement that the very letters of the Quran um, were in themselves magical signposts. One of the things, and you can see from the Quranic verse that I've cited here, Quran 15.1, the first three letters, the A-L-R, Alif Lam Ra, doesn't actually mean anything. And num- a number of Quranic surahs start this way. Um, and the Hurufis, or the letterists, believe that these letters held within them the secret code to understanding the Quran. And if you could construct the letters into yourself, you could truly understand the nature of reality. Um, Hurufism was targeted by the Timurids um, as, a, as a heterodoxy, especially when um, one of the Timurid governors was assassinated by somebody who was believed to be Hurufi. Um, and so this, this movement was wiped off the map. The other movement is much more important for our discussion today. And it centers in the Iranian Azerbaijan region in the city of Ardabil. And it was founded by Sheikh Safi al-Din Ardabili. And so Ardabili was interpreting the Quran and poetry in this very exegetical, botaniya, right? 
internal meaning, this botania view of reality. And he began to build a number of mosques and study centers in Ardabil um, and create a dynasty of uh, Sufi sheikhs or peers, uh, these Sufi sheikhs who would maintain the movement and the movement became named after him, right? His was Sheikh Safi din So the movement became called Safaviya. And as time moved on, this uh, group became more and more militant, especially under the rule of Sheikh Junaid in the late 1400s. So what was going on during, the, uh, during Sheikh Junaid and his successor, uh, Sheikh Haidar's uh, situation? The Timurid Empire was retreating from the Iranian region. Uh, they had been pushed out by the Akhoyun Lalar, the white sheep Turks, uh, led by Uzun Hasan. And at the same time, these uh, Safavids who were, based, who were based in Iran and Azerbaijan began to fight battles that they called jihad, right, this holy war against the Christian Georgians and Armenians and expanded their power. If you look at that map from 1500, you can see them just at the cusp of their massive expansion um, and the green area on the east, on the western bank of the Caspian Sea, that is the beginning of the Safavid um, empire, uh, this empire founded by this Safavia uh, order of Sufis. Now, we had discussed when we looked at it from the Ottoman side that Mehmet II also engaged in war with these white sheep Turks, right? So if you look at the map where that purple uh, flag is waving, that is Tabriz. Um, Tabriz was the capital of the white sheep Turk state at that point. And if you look just to the northeast of that, you can see the areas almost on the border of the Caspian Sea, where at this point the Safavia were holed up. Um, and Mehmed II uh, went to war with uh, the White Sheep Turks in the Battle of Odlukbeli and significantly weakened them. But even that meant that the Safavids would have problems expanding. And so in 1488, trying to take advantage of this, Sheikh Haidar launched an attack against Shirvan, which was a the kingdom in the current Republic of Azerbaijan, and Yakub Ber of the White Sheep Turks at Tabarasan, where he was decisively defeated. And so this young boy, um, I think when this happened, uh, Ismail was in the single digits, um, became the leader of this militant Sufi heterodox Shiite order called the Safaviyya, right? Now, in 1501, he was 14 years old. And because of the fervency of the belief of the Safaviyya that were around him, especially the Turkic tribes that they had begun to convert, um, Ismail was perceived by others and perceived himself almost to be a god. Now, the people around him, the Turks around him that supported him were, were what were called Kizilbash. And they were called Kizilbash because Kizil means red and Bosch means head. And if you look at the picture on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see sort of a maquette of a Kizil Bosch and he's wearing a red cap. These Kizil Bosch Turks we've talked about before because they moved into uh, the Ottoman Empire um, and tried to destabilize it. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, but they're really central in the deification and glorification of Ismail, um, turning him into this God on earth, right? This is a violation of the Tawheed. And it's also a violation of the Vahiriya, that, that these views should be apparent, right? The fact that Shah Ismail is some sort of divine figure only exists because the Kizilbash are reading into the deepness of reality, or so, or so they would argue. Now, as you can see from this map, Ismail with his army of Kizilbash was in the period of 10 years from 1501 until 1510, able to conquer a vast amount of area. He was able to conquer all of the region in the center. The, uh, thanks Patrick. Um, the, the view, uh, sorry, the, the area that Ismail conquered in the center of uh, what, what's called the Jazeera, that area where the Anatolian Peninsula hits um, Mesopotamia, um, he conquered that area, he conquered all of Iran, removing the white sheep Turks from the map, and even expanded into what's now uh, parts of southern Turkmenistan, into Afghanistan, and into modern um, uh, Pakistan. 
Now, uh, Richard, just a quick question. I, I may have missed this. So these were um, Shia Sufi Muslims. What and they were in an area of Turks. Were they? The, what was their ethnicity? Were they Turkic or were they something else? There's a lot of debate as to what ethnicity we should call Ismail. He definitely spoke Turkic, Azerbaijan, uh, he, what we would call today Azerbaijani language, right? Uh, he wasn't speaking Istanbul Turkish. He was speaking something closer to what they speak in Baku today. Um, um, and he's usually identified with Azerbaijanis, but he was also identified with Persians and he spoke fluent Persian. Um, he is identified with a number of his grandparents who come from other competing dynasties, from Greeks, from Georgians. Um, and so he has heritage from a lot of different people. But I think if you had asked him, he would have said he was a Turk. Uh, Richard? Yeah. Uh, sorry, quick question. Um, I heard um, from an Iranian-American scholar um, that... Um, that Shah Ismail came from a branch of Kurdish mystics known as the Akhlahak or the Yarazan. Are you aware of that? Um, I don't believe he came from Yarsan. I think Yarsan came later than him. But there's definitely, you can definitely make the argument that Kurdish mysticism that existed in the north of, um, of Iraq at this time was hugely influential in the development of the Safaviya order. Um, and there was definitely a lot of communication between the Kurds in northern Mesopotamia and uh, the sheikhs in Ardabil. It's not that far apart. I mean, there are mountains between them, but these people were used to moving in the mountains. Um, and they visited each other and exchanged ideas. Um, I would say that the Yarsani belief um, tended to deify or quasi-deify Ali to a much greater extent um, and not say that there had been a person who was living in the present day who had that sort of um, divine presence. Um, the Safaviyya believed that, that the peer of their movement, the, the, the sheikh of their movement, was somehow divinely connected. And we've seen similar sorts of ideas throughout the Eastern Anatolian Turks um, and their views of for example, Baba Ishaq or in, or in the Shakulu rebellion, um, in each of these cases, we have this quasi deification of people who are alive that the Yarsani really don't do. They're still waiting right. for their... It's sort, of, sort of the way that the Ottomans saw Suleiman the Magnificent as the shadow of God, right? Kind of thing. I, I, I would say that they take it a lot further than Suleiman the First did. Um, uh, Suleiman the First certainly would use these kinds of epithets, but, it, but I think like if you were to ask him in public, like, do you see yourself as a prophet of God? Do you see yourself as an avatar of God? Do you see yourself, it, like with any of these terms where he has divinity within him, I think he would reject that. If you ask yeah. Shah Ismail these questions, we're actually going to see he's written poetry to say that he is. Uh -huh. um, any other comments before we go back? Uh, just, just one comment, Richard. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is, I mean, there is writing that that indicates that he came from his his uh, great grandparents came from Kurdistan of and of Kur Kurdish roots. Mm -hmm. But uh, if if there there is a there is a poem that that he recited, and which I think represents his belief, which if if I'm not mistaken, I mean, if you translate it to English, he indicates that he is Fereydun, he is Khosro. Uh, he is Alexander, he is Jesus, he is Zahok. So he actually believed himself a, a deity. And, and then uh, when, when uh, during his, uh, when he conquered Tabriz, in fact, when he stood up, this is what he recited. Yeah, and, no, uh, um, uh, I think, I think that, that's a perfect introduction because I, I think I found the poem that you were looking for and I had included it. Uh, in my presentation. Um, you can see, good. yeah, so you can see that, um, right, he says that he is God's mystery. He also says, for example, in me is prophethood, which for most of the Muslims in the audience, they'll know that this is a direct blasphemous claim. Um, because according to Islam, right, Muhammad is the final prophet. And Accordingly, there can't be any prophets afterwards. So if he's claiming to be a prophet, he's doing something that's outside of the boundaries of acceptable Islam. Uh, Jason, I see you have a hand raised. 
Uh, yeah, just like uh, because he's Turk and the, the dynasty also considered the Iranian dynasty. Sure. And how about Iraq in today's area? Is that one considered I Iranian or considered Arab at that time? At this time, the population would have been majority Arab. Whether or not Persians consider that to be part of greater Iran is certainly a political question that starts at this point in time and continues forward until today. Um, the important distinction I would make is that Iran is a multi-ethnic conglomeration. Persian is an ethnicity, right? Iran is a nationality. And there are many ethnicities within the umbrella of being Iranian. Um, you can think of it sort of like American, right? There's this Obviously, there's a larger ethnic component when it comes to Iran, but it's still this national identity sense. Um, and so there are so you can be Arab and an Iranian. You can be Turkic and an Iranian. You don't have to be Persian to be Iranian. Uh, yeah, you could. Sorry, just to interject. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mentioned Shah Ismail was Kurdish. So that's one example um, of an Iranian ethno-linguistic group that is not Persian but that is Iranian. And another thing that was raised, Iranian nationalists do see Iraq as being part of greater Iran. So there are Iranians who do, as Richard said, who see who want that back as part of Iran. Absolutely. So, so it's like a China, like I think Taiwan is part of China. Oh, so I mean, I, I, I would say there's a difference with Iraq and Iran because of, of uh, Karbala. The, and I don't know if you will get into that. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to get into that with the War of 1533. Yeah, but um, the, the, the point that I would say is really the distinction between China and Taiwan um, is that both China and Taiwan ascribe to this idea of one China, right? That in truth, the, uh, the, both of these belong to the same country. If you asked Iraqis whether they consider themselves part of Iran, with the exception of the Kurdish North, Arab Iraqis would say no, that they're something different from the Iranian conception of their civilization. If you asked nationalistic Iranians, do they consider Iraq to be part of Iran? They would say yes, right? So the fundamental distinction is, that, uh, is, is in that, I would say, um, that Iraqis don't see themselves as Iranians, whereas Iranians see Iraqis as part of Iran. And of course, you have more moderate Iranians today who are not as nationalistic, who like Iran in the borders it is. Um, and so they don't have uh, expansionist claims, especially considering the recent wars between Iraq and Iran that have been incredibly deleterious to both sides. All right. So <laughs> if we go back to 500 years ago, so we have Shah Ismail at the age of 14 or 15, marching through the gates uh, with his army of Kizilbash of Tabriz, right? And remember Tabriz had been the capital of the Akhoyunullah, the white sheep Turks, and these Kizilbash had decisively defeated them. Um, all of these battles from 1501 to 1510 uh, were seen by the Kizilbash as further reaffirming Ismail's godhood and his uh, messi quasi messianic presence. Um, and we even have the battle you can see on the right hand side where uh, Shah Ismail goes all the way to Uzbekistan and fights against uh, Muhammad Shaibani, um, um, uh, Muhammad Shaibani, um, and Mah this ends the last of the Chinggisid states in Central Asia. the The dynasty continues as the Khanate of Bukhara, but it no longer identifies as an actual Timurid state. Um, and this. Uh, brings about the end of Uzbek power um, as an expansionist uh, entity. And it really becomes a number of competing tribes and warlords. So the next stage in what Shah Ismail did after he conquered uh, these territories, including uh, taking Tabriz, was he engaged in the forced conversion of the Sunnis of the region. Now, this is sort of counterintuitive to most people today because most people know today that the dominant aspect that makes Iran distinct and unique is that Shiism is the dominant uh, Muslim sect in Iran. That was not the case when Shah Ismail came to power, um, taking that land from the white sheep Turks. 
most Iranians were Sunni at this time. Um, and when he conquered the city of Tabriz, he moved all of the population into the Masjid al Jomeh, which you can see on the left hand side, it's one of the largest mosques uh, in Iran. And so once they were in the Masjid al Jomeh, um, he had Kizilbash guard the outside of the mosque and force everybody in. And in the mosque, he initiated the cursing of the first three caliphs which is seen as a massive blasphemy um, among Sunni Muslims who consider all four of the caliphs to be rightly guarded, uh, right, rightly guided. It just happened that Ali, which was the one that the Shiites favored, only came to power in the fourth, uh, in, uh, as the fourth caliph. Um, and additionally, previous Shiite governments, like we talked about the Fatimids in Egypt, did not uh, curse the first three caliphs. This was a new invention of the Safaviyya um, as part of their heterodox view of Islam. And when it came to the cursing, you have this phrase, uh, um, which was which is difficult to translate. Um, I would go with the idiomatic of may their curses ever increase. Um, and Shah Ismail forced the Sunnis on pain of death to continually recite this phrase as they were cursing the caliphs. And this ritualized action then spread throughout the empire. It started in Tabriz, but um, went, throughout the, went throughout the state. And Sunnis in many different parts of Iran were forcibly converted to Shiism. Another major forcible conversion that we see during this period is the eradication of the Sufis. Um, is, is the eradication of the Sufis. Now, one of the things, even during the Timurid period, you had a large number of Sufis who were in Iran um, writing poetry from a lot of different sects. We talked about some of the ones that were Shiite heterodox, like the Hurufis, but there were also a, new, a number of ones from the Sunni side. Um, a perfect example is Omar Khayyam, right? Um, who is famous for writing numerous quatrains. He was a Sunni Sufi. Uh, in Iran, and there were numerous different uh, tariqat or orders of Sunnis that existed in Iran. We also remember, for example, when we talked about the Mevlana, uh, Jalal al-Din Rumi and his view that spread in the western part of Anatolia. Remember, Jalal al-Din Rumi was born in Iran, and his movement, the Mevlana, was originally started in Iran. These movements um, that had defined Iranian, let's say, religious uh, moderation and openness to new ideas were thoroughly repressed. Many of these tariqat were shut down uh, and the only uh, Sufi order that was allowed to stand was the Safaviyya. Hey, uh, Richard, just a quick question. I heard um, some, there are people who debate whether or not Omar, Omar, Omar Khayyam was an atheist uh, or, or a, a Sunni Sufi. So do you have like is, is it definitive that he was a Sunni Sufi or? Uh, he's definitely a Sufi. Whether or not he's atheist is a question that's debatable. Um, uh, uh, with, uh, um, I'm trying to find the right way to say this. Uh, one of the things that Sufism pressed forward, right, is this idea of Batiniya. Batiniya doesn't just exist in Safaviyya. Um, it exists throughout the Sufis. Um, and the extent to which you push the Batiniya is where it becomes more or less acceptable to traditional um, versions of Islam. So where, uh, where Omar Khayyam was, was at a point where it was still acceptable, right? It's still within the fold. Um, he, hasn't, he hadn't asserted anything that was patently un-Islamic. Um, but at the same time, uh, he was definitely flirting with the boundaries and the way that he flirted with the boundaries, especially when it came to drinking wine and his discussion of the, the meaninglessness of life, these sorts of questions sort of put him at the edge of what's acceptable and have led a lot of historical scholars to question whether or not he believed at all, right? Um, and whether he was just in order to save face. So you, so you have both of these views, but I don't think that either one would mean that he's not Sufi because Sufis are pressing the edge. Uh, Ralph, I noticed you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm not, I don't wanna ask a, a theological question, but I, I, I was just wondering uh, in terms of this um, uh, conqueror, uh, 
would, would, would his army or the armies of any of his opponents, uh, I mean, you know, in terms of firepower and all, how would they, uh, how do you think they would match up with Western armies at this time around 1500? Uh, I would say it had much more to do with um, the physical nature of the battlefield, supply lines, other sorts of issues than the actual weapons that anybody was holding. Um, we uh, the, the biggest difference, I would say, is that if you compared these to European armies, they don't have firearms yet, or they don't have firearms that are used effectively yet. We're going to get to the actual use of firearms in, in the Kizilbash as we move into the later periods. But um, but the Kizilbash were still primarily a horseback military, right? We saw in the, right, uh, you can see in the picture of the fight between Shah Ismail and Mohammed Shaibani, um, most of the Kizilbash are on steeds. Um, and so it was very much a Turkic army in that sense of nomadic um, attacks. So again, but I think if you were talking about would Europeans threaten this, Europeans were not interested in militarily fighting the Safavid Empire on Persian soil. Um, the supply lines would just be too long for them. Thank you. Uh, I have a raised you... hand from uh, Jason. Uh, yes, can you show the previous picture with the uh, uh, the sign, uh, no, uh, back, 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 previous one. Oh yeah, yeah, this one. On the left hand side, you have two, you have a four, uh, no, 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 the previous one. No, the, the one with uh, 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 bend, you bend the three. No, you, you pass too far. Okay, one, one more, back, back. Uh, what, what, what picture is it? Yeah, the picture with uh, a, a mask, right? And you put a, four signs and uh, one is allowed three is is allowed a bandit right and this one yeah, yeah. three are bandit what's the three are bandit are right bandit? Uh, all those four are, are circles that i put in there representing the four caliphs right you have four, abu bakr you have four. abu bakr in the upper right hand side you have omar in the upper left hand side you have uthman in the lower right hand side and you have ali in the lower left hand side those are the four rightly guided caliphs that we discussed more in depth in the oh. uh fourth lecture um oh. in the series and the curses were on the first three right which is why they have the the cross out ali was considered the first rightly guided caliph in the shiite tradition especially the shiite tradition of the safaviyah i have a hand rise from kobe uh, um, is there any evidence of the Safavids using bringing back war elephants? Um, possibly bringing back war elephants back. No, that we don't know if the Sassanids use war elephants. So that's. Uh, um, but this. Uh, but given the cavalry-based nature of the warfare and their relation to India, um, it would probably make tactical sense to bring war elephants to. Uh, cause uh, to annoy the horde to cut to disperse the ca enemy cavalry with the with the elephant smell. Um, I don't know the extent to which war elephants were used, but yes, um, the Safavids had a good trade relationship with the Mughals, and we know that they used horse uh, they they used war elephants in their military. Again, I couldn't tell you the the size and scope of that usage. My intuition would be that it would be minimal. Hmm. Uh, Rob, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh the issue with war elephants and, and the area that they were, the food supply for the, for the war elephants would be minimal. So the, the effectiveness, you, you really don't see much usage in that area. Uh, Kobe, uh, you raised your hand again. Oh, I accidentally, I didn't mean to raise your hand, but how did that, but didn't the Sassanid, the, the Achimids use it against the Macedonians and also the Seleucids use that purchase their war elephants through Iran? Yes. Um, but that's like, a, um, but uh, so what changed? So is it an environmental change that that made the it's, logistics it's, that, of war elephants harder? You no, know, it's it's the size of the militaries. Exactly. Um, if you have you know five hundred war elephants in the classical period, that is a sizable force. If you have five hundred war elephants at this period in time, you'll be, you're encountering an army of twenty thousand horseback soldiers it's it, oh. you're not you're not going to prevail and so the mm -hmm. size made it a problem um mm -hmm. howard 
Yeah, I did a presentation on King Paris a couple months ago, and I was dealing, I asked about war elephants, and I was looking into it. Uh, Paris typically had, like, I think mean, Paris and Hannibal typically had 20 to 50 elephants in armies of 20 to 40,000 people. So the number of elephants is quite small. Um, the Romans were horrified when they first saw the elephants, but then they just went back and learned to fight them. Elephants aren't the best. The, el if elephants panic, they run away and trample your own soldiers. Um, there are ways to deal with them. So, you know, once mm -hmm. you've had elephants thrown at you a couple of times, you learn. Yeah. Um, I think but, how desert, how desert like is this area? You're, you're, you're commenting on food. Yeah. Um, so, marching okay. elephants around Sicily is manageable. Okay. So if you look at this map, um, the area that was conquered in 1504, two thirds of that is desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I, like an elephant, what does an elephant eat? 300 pounds of food a day? Yeah, something like that. Then, um, yeah, and, and the thing is, is that you bring up a really great point, which is that elephants can be defeated if you know how to uh, mess with their psychology. Um, mm -hmm. Timur, for example, did this where he set camels on fire and had them run at elephants. And the elephants, uh, which had been raised by the Delhi Sultanate in defense of their position, um, had sharpened, poisoned tusks. And these elephants then turned right around and gored their entire military. Uh, it was one of the bloodiest conflicts on the Indian subcontinent for that century. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. just... Well, I, I brought up the example of the Americans fighting Mitsubishi Zeros in World War II. You develop a series of rules you follow in combat, and if you don't follow them, the Zero kills you. If you do follow them, you win. Yeah. So, so um, if we move forward a little bit, we get to 1510, right? Uh, Shah Ismail has consolidated his power over Persia, over the Jazeera, that area between Mesopotamia and um, Anatolia, in Mesopotamia as well, and in the beginnings of Central Asia in the Khorasan region. He's also seeing the Ottoman Empire as his greatest threat, right? We, we've seen in previous lectures that by this point, the Ottomans had consolidated their control over almost all of the Anatolian Peninsula, and they have a significant holding in the Balkans. Um, so Shah Ismail sends some of his Kizilbash into um, the areas that Ottomans control, um, and they evangelize among a lot of the poorer nomadic Turks and convert them, um, leading to an uprising um, in the Ottoman Empire. Now, of course, we talked about this. This was during the reign of Bayezid II, um, who was generally sort of an... Um, who was sort of an absentee um, ruler, uh, a sultan at this period. And it was his fourth son, Selim, um, who was based in the city of Trabzon at the easternmost edge of the empire, who really co uh, coordinated the effort of the empire to defeat this rebellion in 1511. And then in 1512, this Prince Selim uh, overthrew his father, and took power, right? That was the story of Selim the Grim. Um, he was sultan for eight years and conquered more territory than the Ottoman Empire had held before um, altogether. Uh, Kobe, I see your hand is raised. Okay, so uh, I, I know that like in the three 500s, the Sassanids expanded into Arabia. The Shiites, um, okay, the so Shah Ali or Shah or the Shah um, has like a religious interest in Mecca. Um, and probably a, a easier route into all the into um, Saudi Arabia, future Saudi Arabia, than the Ottomans by this point. Are we seeing any um, any Iranian movements into um, um, Saudi Arabia into Arabia to aiming at Mecca and Medina? The problem is that they don't have a through way to get there. Um, so if they were able to, remove the Ottoman Empire from the easternmost parts of their control in Anatolia, then the Safavids may have a shot at taking uh, Mecca Medina. At this point in the year 1511, those territories were in the control of the Mamluk Sultanate, and the Mamluk Sultanate was a nominal ally of the Safavids. So the Safavids were not going to go to war with it to, to take that territory. Um, when it comes under Ottoman control, then it becomes much more of something that's acceptable to shoot for. But by that point, their military ability to expand is, is significantly constrained. So we really don't see Persians launching an attack across the desert to get Mecca and Medina. Cool. All right. So 
then we get to the confrontation with the Ottomans that I've been setting up now, right? You have the Ottomans, right? I wish I had a map that was in English, so I'll, I'll try and translate what's going on here. You have the Ottomans on the left, upper left side in the dark green. You have the um, Mamluk Sultanate in the lower left-hand side of the screen in sort of that paler green. You have the Safavid area of control in the orange. And you have that Jazeera, that area between Mesopotamia and Anatolia, that's sort of striped between white and, and, uh, and orange. And those are areas that had been at least nominally brought under Persian control, under Safavid control, but were still relatively mountainous and difficult to control directly. So they were under the rule of nominal warlords. And the war with the Ottomans started um, when Selim, now having taken power, as a result of overthrowing his father, was furious with the Kizilbash um, in his reign. And so you can see that red arrow as he marches from Istanbul, the capital city, all the way to the border regions. As he stops in each of these cities, he has a list of all the Shiite men who are in any of these particular cities between the ages of seven and 70 years old. And when he arrives in these towns, he has them all slaughtered. So you can see uh, Shah, uh, Sultan Selim, um, went uh, to most of the major areas uh, in the Ottoman Empire. He went to Yenishehir, he went to Konya, right? We talked about Konya, the holy city. Um, he went along the borders um, of two small uh, city-states, the Dulkadarids and the Ramazanids. He made his way to, uh, to Sivas, to Erzinjan, um, and he finally extended all the way to Chaldiran. Now, Chaldiran is at the westernmost border of Iran today, and it was at the edge of um, Shah Ismail's direct control. And this was an incredibly bloody, bloody battle uh, between um, Shah Ismail and um, Sultan Selim. This battle of Chaldiran, which took place in one day, um, was disastrous for the Persians. And it was disastrous because the Kizilbash were effectively a singular fighting force of light cavalry, which was incredibly successful against other light cavalry forces, like they had been facing against the white sheep Turks or against the Shabanids, but was not effective against the Ottomans who had light cavalry as well as artillery and arquebusiers. Um, you can see the arquebusier sort of in the black and white on the upper left-hand side. Um, and the reason that Selim wanted to push this attack was that he wanted to increase trade with India. Um, and he wanted to establish this point in order to force the Safavids to accept being a client state of the Ottomans and therefore bridge uh, the divide with India, right? Because they couldn't control the water routes. Those were controlled by the Europeans and they couldn't control the, uh, the more direct Indian Ocean coastal route because that was controlled by the Mamluks at this period. Now, the Safavids worked incredibly hard in order to unseat Selim before this conflict even began, including supporting his brother, Ahmed, uh, in a bid against him in, uh, in the earlier part of his reign, around 1512-1513. And Ahmed even did rise up against Selim, um, but Selim was wise enough to his plot and uh, ensnared him uh, in a trap, eventually killing him. So this battle was incredibly shattering from a Persian perspective because these Kizilbash had rallied behind Shah Ismail as their quasi divinity, right? And he just smashed, uh, he was just smashed upon, upon the mountainside. And we have numerous instances, for example, of women even fighting in the battle of Chaldiran on the Persian side um, because they just wanted to stop, stop the, the Ottomans from winning and they just, they couldn't. Uh, Selim, him, uh, sorry, uh, Ismail himself uh, withdrew from the battle and became almost inconsolable. And we're going to talk a little bit about that soon. Uh, to, uh, I have a hand raised, uh, Kobe. Uh, so if you look at the territory briefly occupied by the um, Safavids, it looks I, that it might be a little bit to the act. I mean, this might not be true because it, Armenian territory might be closer to the west of this, but um, he captured, but he, but the Armenians probably had a decisive factor in this. Like, which, uh, like, did the were the Armenians so so? Did the Armenians make things easy for Shah Ismail? 
No, not at all. Um, the Armenians are are pretty much irrelevant in this battle. Um, the the important thing to remember is that at this point, Armenian relations in the Ottoman Empire were quite positive. Um, the the deterioration of the Ottoman Armenian relationship happens in the 19th century, and we're going to eventually get to that. You know, sometime in May or June or whatever. Um, but the at this point in time the armenians um are fine in the ottoman empire and they're relatively fine in the safavid empire um the safavids for their islamic purity at this point in time are not engaging in anti-christianity we're going to see that later but not at this point so um so the armenians are not pro one side or the other and also the armenians don't have weapons Right. You have to remember that only Muslims are allowed to keep and bear arms in either of these empires. So um, there it's not it's not really a battle force. And the last independent Armenian state was destroyed 500 years ago, cool. like in this region. Cilicia fell a little bit more recently. Mm. All right. So after this collapse in 1514, you, ha as I said, Shah Ismail becomes inconsolable. He retreats to a monastery and he just drinks copious amounts of alcohol. That's pretty much the only thing we hear from him for the next 10 years of his life. Um, and uh, the empire is run by Grand Vizier Mirza Shah Hussein. And Mirza Shah Hussein is the first of the Tufan Shiagasi. And the Tufan Shiagasi are the first Safavid arquebusiers, right? Because we've seen that on the Ottoman side, they had these arquebusiers. They were incredibly powerful um, and they won this battle of Chaldiran. In fact, even after the battle, the, uh, yeah. In fact, after the battle, the Ottomans were able to conquer Tabriz. Uh, they couldn't hold it because of the supply line issues, but um, Shah Ismail was no longer in any fit state to rule. This Mirza Shah Hussein came to power specifically because he reunited Shah Ismail with one of his wives, uh, Tajli Begum. One of the ways that Sultan Selim punished Shah Ismail for setting up uh, Shehzadi Ahmed, the, the prince, to try and remove him from power was by kidnapping his wives and refusing to return them. So now these wives were in the harem in Istanbul, unable to return to Persia, but uh, Tajli Begum had not been captured. She had just fled the battle. Um, so Mirza Shah Hussein was able to find her. And when he found her, um, reuniting her with, uh, with the boy king, um, uh, basically Shah Ismail made him the uh, grand vizier for the last 10 years of his life. And he died in 1524, um, basically, basically tired and drunk. So what ends up happening during this period um, at the end of Shah Ismail's life and the beginning of the reign of his son, Shah Tahmasp, is that the Kizilbash tribes begin to fight each other. Now, there's a debate in the scholarship as to whether this was a civil war between the Kizilbash or this was something more like the Kizilbash would form factions and, and factions would repress the other factions at court, but that wouldn't lead to large scale uh, violence across the country. It's unclear um, which way it goes, and it's still a uh, heavily researched topic. To the former camp, we have many cases of small battles occurring throughout the Iranian plateau between different Kizilbash tribes, different Kizilbash tribes being um, ex uh, exiled or uh, removed from coalitions. There was certain a lot of power, certainly a lot of power changing hands. At the same time, during this period, which was from 1524 to 1533, we see that Shah Tahmasp uh, is working with a number of Kizilbash advisors. You can see in the picture on the upper right hand side that he's working with Ramlu and Shuha, who are two of these advisors, and that he fights the Battle of Jam um, in against the Afghans. Um, using the forces of the Shamlu Kizilbash. So he clearly had control of some of the Kizilbash and they were able to unite against enemies to the empire. So maybe it wasn't a civil war. It's, in, it's not entirely clear uh, what this relationship was. 
But by 1533, Shatah Mosque was able to consolidate control and become one of the longest reigning monarchs in Persian history. He ruled for over 50 years. So he did a number of different things during his reign, and we're going to go through some of them in more detail. But a few that I want to sort of sprinkle out is that he reestablished the Persian buro uh, bureaucracy. Now, during the reign of Shah Ismail, the Kizilbash had had untrammeled control uh, of the state, but Shah Tahmas realized that in order to, ma to manage an empire as large as the Safavids controlled, you needed the uh, historic Persian bureaucrats. And so you began to have this delineation within the Safavid empire of, quote, the men of the sword, who were the Kizilbash, and the men of the pen, who were these bureaucrats. And Persia had had a long tr a tradition of bureaucracy under the various Islamic states and even before then. So there was a large number of bureaucrats and the Nizamiya, which was a university system that was producing these bureaucrats. Um, and so it was very easy to integrate them into the empire from a logistical perspective, um, maybe not as much from a factional perspective. Shah Tahmas also maintained very good relations with the Mughals. You can see in the center pane, uh, Shah Tahmas on the right-hand side, uh, Humayun uh, on the left-hand side, Humayun was an exiled um, uh, prince of the Mughals. Um, and Shah Tahmas uh, saw to it that he was seated back on his throne in exchange for Kandahar as a province of the Safavids. Shah Tahmas is also very famous for beginning the process of uh, miniatures, again, in Iran. Now, miniatures are these painted folios with writing and images. This on the right-hand side is a folio of the Shah Nameh. Um, and uh, in particular, it's the story of Isfendiar slaying a dragon. Now, what's interesting to note here is that this, like most of the parts of the Shah Nameh, is a pre-Islamic piece. So uh, it was part of Persian culture that preceded Islam and continued, uh, despite Islam, to merit support and uh, development, the painting of a dragon, of course, a mythical creature, would have gone against a number of Sunni doctrines. Um, to, uh, but under the Shiite rulership, uh, it was entirely permissible. Uh, you can actually see this folio if you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, okay. So now we go to the war with Suleiman the First Kanuni. This is Suleiman of the Ottoman Empire. While Shah Tahmasp was able to control the Safavids' eastern frontiers with the various states of Central Asia and the Mughals, he was completely unable to deal with the Ottoman threat. Um, Suleiman was modernizing his army much more effectively and much more concertedly than, uh, than Shah Tahmasp and uh, Ismail had done. In particular, for example, if we look at the city of Vaughan, which, um, which is sort of that little lake, uh, on the left-hand side, um, the Ottomans had already built an alliance with the French. And so French military commanders were actually there at Vaughan teaching the Ottomans how to use cannons in lined formation, how to bombard city defenses. Um, it, was, uh, it was a bloodbath uh, from the Persian side. You also had Suleiman conquering Baghdad in 1534, um, which was a huge blow to the Safavids. The reason why it's a huge blow, as Aaron mentioned earlier, is that you have the city of Karbala in south and southern Iraq and An Najaf. Karbala and An Najaf are sites of Shiite pilgrimage, um, and for the Safavids to have controlled these cities was seen as a sign that the Safavids were protected by God, um, and that the Shiites would be able to perform these routine pilgrimages. That said, when Suleiman conquered Baghdad, he made an, an agreement that uh, the Persians could send pilgrims to Karmala and Ananja. But of course, the numbers were never anything close to what they had been. Sultan Suleiman had tried to make peace with other leaders in the uh, Safavid rulership. Um, but generally speaking, um, they were only able to sign a peace in 1555 after Shah Tahmasp realized that there was no way that he would be able to repel the Ottoman advance and simply accepted that this would happen. On the flip side though, um, Shah Tahmasp began to expand by, uh, into the Caucasus region and he invaded Shirvan, right? Modern day Azerbaijan and the kingdoms of Georgia, Kartli, Kacheti, Imareti, um, that were in that region. He begins to bring home um, 
Georgian and Circassians as captives um, and converting these people to Islam. Uh, Circassians hadn't yet converted to Islam. They, they would in subsequent centuries. Of course, the Georgians remained mostly Christian. Um, he converted these people to Islam and he incorporated them into what were called the Kurchi. And you can see a Kurchi on the right-hand side. The Kurchi were a, an attempt by the Safavids to counter the authority and power of the Qazilbash. So the Kurchi were another group of slave soldiers, very similar if you can compare them to the Janissaries in that their loyalty was strictly to the Sultan because they were the slaves of the Sultan and they were conquered from these Christian majority regions um, in Georgia and Circassia. The Kurchi were in numbers far fewer than the Qazilbash, but because of their experience with Western weaponry and their closeness to the king as his royal bodyguards, they had a disproportionate amount of power in, uh, in the um, Ottoman world, uh, sorry, in the Safavid world. Um, you can also see from this map sort of what the geopolitical situation was as these Qazilbash were revolting across the country. Um, and at each point, other Kizilbash and the Kurchi had to put down these revolts where Kizilbash were trying to seek more power. So at the same time that we have these problems on the Western flank, we have problems on the Eastern flank. And you have numerous Khanates in Central Asia that launch invasions. Um, and you have at least five of these invasions in uh, over the course of Shatah Masp's reign. He's able to hold them back um, but um, at the same time, that means that those are forces that he cannot devote to other sides of the empire and uh, also money that he can't spend in revitalizing the economy. The Safavids began to interact with the Europeans, and the reason they did so was, to was that they realized that that Western frontier with the Ottomans was a serious threat to them. And so they reached out um, to uh, almost all the empires of Western Europe. They sent Hussein Ali Beyh. Um, he was a Kizilbash from the Bayat uh, tribe. And so Hussein Ali Beyh went to Venice. He went to Vienna. He went to London. He went to Paris. Um, he went to Madrid. And he met with the leaders of the various Western European states in an attempt to, uh, sorry, not to Paris, but all the other ones, yes, uh, in order to form a coalition against the Ottomans. Um, part of the response to that was the, the, uh, was the trip of Robert Shirley, who was a British military general. Uh, you can see him sort of dressed there in a more Persian-style outfit. Uh, he went to Iran and helped organize the Tufang Shia Ghasi, these um, uh, arquebusiers in the Safavid army, in order to uh, launch a fight against uh, the Ottomans. At the same time, um, the Ottomans had direct adversarial relations with the Portuguese, and the Portuguese were able to uh, take key islands uh, like Kreshem and like uh, Hormuz Island in the Strait of Hormuz, which directly threatened um, the ability of uh, the Persians to uh, trade with India, um, especially through the Persian Gulf. So if we sort of think of it writ large, this is what the alliances look like, right? You have France and the Ottomans working together um, against the Habsburgs and the Persians working together. And the Portuguese have really expanded into this part of the world. We sort of covered that a little bit before, um, but they are now in direct competition with Persia and through the control of all of these ports along the Persian Gulf, they have managed to hold back um, Persian expansion um, and uh, expand, and the Portuguese were able to uh, expand their own trade in this region. Um, Alfonso do Albuquerque, who you can see here on the upper right hand side, um, was a major admiral in the Portuguese Navy and inflicted uh, the most serious loss on, uh, on the Safavids, which was the taking of uh, Kashem and Hormuz, uh, specifically. Um, the fort of Our Lady of Conception on Hormuz Island. Of course, the biggest um, loss 
to the Portuguese was Oman. And you can see that Oman was littered with Portuguese uh, castles along its frontier. Now, Shah Mosp ruled relatively effectively until he died in, uh, in, 12, in 1576. Um, but uh, his children were not um, the brightest, shall we say. Shah Ismail II succeeded him, but he succeeded him on the word of his favored child, which was his daughter, Pari Khan Khatun. And Pari Khan um, believed that Ismail would be relatively easier to control. So she, with, uh, so she brought him out of Kakahe uh, Castle, where he was imprisoned in the dungeon by his father for over a decade at this point. And he had gone crazy and mad. So he did a number of things, um, the worst of which was that he um, tried to change the state religion from Shiite Islam to Sunni Islam. Um, and uh, of course, this was met with very negative reactions from the Qazil Bash. But what sealed his fate was when he tried to ostracize his sister Pari Khan, and then he suddenly dropped dead of mis mysterious circumstances. Um, most people believe he was poisoned, but we don't know um, what the actual circumstances were. Um, Pari Khan decided to elevate um, her other uh, brother, uh, Muhammad Khodamande. He was one of the few brothers of Ismail that wasn't murdered by Ismail II um, when he went on his purge um, during the, uh, during the uh, pro-Sunni uh, change. But Mohammed Khodamande was, if we use the modern term, institutionalized. Not, uh, he was, if Shah Ismail was crazy, Shah Mohammed was incompetent. Um, and the main force behind his throne for at least the first year was his wife, um, uh, who's known by the epithet Mahde Olia. Um, Mahde Olia and Pari Khan Khatun um, had a personality conflict um, for a year before Mahde Olia was herself executed. Um, now, this period in uh, Safavid rule um, from 1576 to 1587 was uh, very similar to what we're gonna see in the Ottoman Empire in the Sultanate of Women, where the women of the court had direct relations with the Kizilbash and it was they who were really running the affairs of state. Pari Khan Khatun and Mahde Olia were really um, the, the leaders, the ones that the Kizilbash referred to, uh, spoke to, um, and it was the men who, had, who held the ceremony in pomp and circumstance, but they had very little uh, real power in terms of their ability to run the empire. And for, and for both of them, they didn't really seem terribly interested in doing that. It's the Kardashian phase of the empire. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's the Kardashian phase of the empire. Um, now, of course, the Ottomans are not just going to sit there and watch their enemy to the east um, have this kind of uh, tribal intrigue and not take advantage of it. So in 1578, the Ottomans launch an invasion, and this is the farthest east expanse of Ottoman power. They, um, they concretize their control over um, uh, Iranian Azerbaijan, all of the Caucasus region, and Luristan, um, which, uh, which was and the Iranians went from bad to worse in this war, finally suing for peace in 1590 to stop the, stop the territory hemorrhaging. Now, you have to understand how deeply saddening this loss would have been. All of the historic territories of, of the Safavia were now in the hands of the Ottomans. It was incredibly demoralizing. So when Shah Abbas I, um, came to power, he really set up, uh, set up to try and centralize the bureaucracy, organize the state, and then begin his own wars of expansion to counter the threat. And so you can see, if you look at this map here, I wish there was one with more color contrast, but you can see that the Western border of the Safavid empire was that dotted line, very close to um, uh, Kazvin, which was the capital, um, before moving to Isfahan. Now, Shah Abbas launched wars to take uh, uh, Mesopotamia back and to take the Caucasus back, um, as well as uh, make sure that he uh, conquered Kandahar once again from the Afghans who had taken it during the reign of Muhammad Khodabande. So 
but the thing, but the, uh, but I would rather focus in terms of Shah Abbas on what he did from an architectural and structural perspective, because Shah Abbas, despite being the warrior who brought the Safavid Empire to its largest territorial extent, also brought the Safavid Empire to its largest cultural extent. And uh, Rob is going to help me here uh, in going through the various buildings and structures of um, that really show uh, Shah Abbas and Safavid Persia. Okay, um, well, to to begin, what I'd like to state is that, you know, Shah Tahmaseb started architectural work within the Safaviyya dynasty. Before that, it was, it was really not there. And he started in Qazvin, and where his capital was, I think it was in 1555. And until, until that point, you really did not have that much of a growth in, in Persian arts. He also, Shah Tahmas also reinvigorated the, the Shah Nome. So he once again brought back the history, the tales of, of the Persian uh, identity, which effectively is what kept the Persian language remaining being Farsi and not Arabic. So if you look at the Safavid dynasty, it really started flourishing during the reign of Shah Abbas. And, and uh, Shah Abbas moved the capital from Qazvin to Esfahan, where he was further away from the Ottomans and it was centralized and he could uh, manage the country in a, in a more uh, Persian manner, more forced manner. He wanted to, to, to bring in the farce components and it is the first sign of, of, of an Iranian nation once again, post, post uh, Sasania dynasty. So if you were to look at the era, Iran, Persia was, was under the control of uh, Turco Mongol for about 500 until the Safavia uh, came around. And at this point of Shah Abbas is, is where you see the, the country beginning to flourish and, and establish itself within the Persian culture and, and trying to evolve what had been here in the past. And, and there, are, there are a number of things that you see evolving. One is manuscripts. There were single sheet manuscripts rather than books. These were, these were allowed and brought into to, to existence by Shah Abbas and his commissioning of art and literature. And then the other is, is the ceramics. The ceramics, uh, which, which is to, to this day is called the half rang, is, is based on the seven colors. So there are the colors and, and what you see used to build, I'm sorry, Richard, do I have control of the thing or do you? Uh, I do, you just tell Okay, me sorry, uh, can we go to the next? Uh, so this is the centerpiece of, uh, of, of Safavier and Shah Abbas's uh, architectural growth. And, and what you see is, this is also really the only thing that remains of Safavier architect that's still in existence. Most of everything else that was built throughout the, throughout the empire uh, has either collapsed, destroyed. So even if you look at the, the first uh, mosque, the Jom'e Mosque in Tabriz that uh, Richard showed earlier, that is a reconstruction and it's not of the true uh, Safadiya architect. You do see the the, the ceramics, you do see the structure, but it's, it's all new and newly reconstructed. So this is, uh, this is Maidana Shah, or the, it's, it's also what is known as, as the, the garden of the world. And uh, to the right, that is Ali Kapu, the palace of Ali Kapu. And to the end, it's Masjid Jame which is, uh, if you can go to the, to the next slide, please. So this is Ali Kapu. This is, this, is this is the palace. And 
what you see is the ceramic works. The ceramics works are, are all half rank. So this is really a sign of what you would find in the Safavid dynasty. And this is what has effectively uh, grown into what is today's Persian ceramics works and Iranian ceramics works. So most of the mosques, most of the uh, buildings, official buildings would have a similar style to what you see here. Uh, can we go to the next please? Uh, so the reflection pool and, and uh, Master de Jaume is, is really, uh, you see that blue hue is, is the cobalt. It's, it's, it's the mines that were used to, to construct and build and, and make all the ceramics are actually in Ardabil. So this goes back to the roots of where the Safavi has started and to the, and to the Azerbaijan region of Iran. And, and most of this ceramic works evolve out of mines of Ardabil. And, and, and the cobalt that you see, I mean, it's uh, pretty much a lot of the dating that has been done and a lot of the, the chemical signatures that, that have been uh, tested and, and uh, referred back, it refers back to the mines of Ardabil. Any questions? Yeah, um, I was curious because we saw how in that map that um, when Shah Abbas took power that he didn't have control over Ardabil, um, was, was, put, was making the mosques, this kind of cobalt, a signature of the fact that he had reconquered that territory yes. and that he reintegrated that history? Yes. And, and what you do, I mean, this, this whole area was, was to reflect who he was and what he was. You know, this is what is called Maidana Shah or the, or, or the square of the king. This is where everyone was to come and, and, and see the, the greatness of the Safavid Empire and the gardens of Persia. And this was supposed to be a reflection of what Persopolis was to the Hakamanish or the Achaemenid. Uh, yeah. So this was supposed to be that representation. Now, if you were to go back to Esmail, where Esmail was really not educated. He did venture into poetry and he did like poetry, but his education was limited and, and he was not a patron of the arts. Shah Abbas on the other end was effectively, he loved art and he loved structures and, and architecture and he wanted to be a grandiose king of kings. So this is what he saw as his reflection of his kingdom. Now, how this area is set up is merchants and uh, makers of all different Persian items to include silk carpets mm -hmm. are surrounding this center. And this is where the Europeans came to trade so European trade was effectively managed out of Maidana Shah. So this was the first place where emissaries entered into the kingdom, where emissaries were greeted. So what they saw was the enormity and the beauty of, of these gardens. And if you, if you go back and, and uh, I've, I've gone back through some of these uh, old newspaper articles that goes uh, that were published in, in colonial time in the US. There are stories of, of Maidana Shah in Isfahan and of the Safavid dynasty as it was presented by the Brit British. And this is the first, I guess, first real reflection of Safavid architect as we know it today so can we go uh, and again this if you if you look uh, this is master the shah and uh, this area if you look to the top now you do see the ceramics the blue cobalt ceramics you also see 
not so well in this, but there are mirrors. So what's called Ainekari. So if we can go to the next, uh, next slide, please. So this is called Ainekari or mirror works. So this again is a reflection of, of the Safavid dynasty. And by reflection, you see that there is a lot of mirror works that reflects light, reflects color, and how they perceived, how the Safavi and Shah Abbas perceived himself as, as, a, as a king, as, as, as one who will uh, bring light. So this is the typical Safavi architecture in the mosques, in the buildings. Can we go to the next, please? And then, okay, Masjid al Lutfa Ali Khan. Uh, this, again, you can see the ceramics, you can see the, the, uh, the typical Safaviyya mosques. Now, what you see here, you will also discover in many of the Shia mosques throughout the region. So in Oman, if you go into the Shia mosques of Oman, this is again what you will see. So this signature of the Safaviyya and the Shia controversy is in effect part of day Shiism and, and, and discover in, throughout the region. Okay. This is one that I added. This is the Ali Kapu Gate in in Kazvin, because we have a lot of architecture from Isfahan. And this was actually from an earlier period. This is, of course, from, uh, this is the outer gate of uh, Jahel Shutun uh, when it was in uh, Kazvin. Um, and you can see, this is one of the seven gates that still survives. And you can, and there is, of course, the internal architecture. You have the Islamic quotations and the beautiful inside of the dome that has this sort of swirling effect. Now, this is the, the garden of uh, Chel Sutun. Bob means garden in Farsi. So Chel Sutun means 40 columns. So this is the garden of 40 columns. And uh, you do see the reflection and, and, and what, what is in the, in the Persian uh, mindset, the garden, the orchards are very central. And, and what you do see from back into the Hakamanish time, the Ak Akhmadian, all the way through the Sasani and into the Safavi, and in today, you see orchards and gardens of flowers, trees that are central to the ruling as well as to, to people's relaxation. So this is the Chel Satun Gardens or Bog. Can we go to the next? Can we go to the next slide, please? And this is a day, daytime view of it. What you do see again is the mirror work, the Ainekari, and, and, and the reflection of the, the, pond, the pools. So the gardens, the pools, the mirrors, you see, you see that reflection and the reflectivity of, of, of everything that is there to make it even larger and more grandiose. Any questions? Can we go to the next, please? Now, this is the rear side of the same building. So again, you see the reflecting pool, the gardens. This is typical of what you would see. And in fact, when you, if you ever travel to Esfahan, this is what you will see in the central part of, of, uh, of the city. And, uh, and there is, interestingly enough, a large Christian community on the outskirts, as well as Jewish communities on the outskirts of, of Isfahan as well, which, which their buildings are also, in a way, similar in architect and structure. Uh, I, have a, I have a raised hand from Ralph. Yes. I, yeah, just a question. To what extent were these sort of private gardens or places 
for the rulers or to what extent were these public? Were the mosques open to Friday prayers by thousands of people to anybody who wanted to come? How, to what extent, how public or private were these uh, sites at the time? Uh, at the time, uh, the Maidan Shah was open to all. This was the center of trade. So Maidan Shah was the center of trade for, for the Safadiyat Shah Abbas period. And the mosques were open to the public. Now, the orchards, the gardens that were in the area, they were open, but the ones that were in, in, in the palaces or the ones that were in private hands were closed. And if you notice, most, most of those orchards or gardens have high walls. Even to this day, most, in fact, all homes and all orchards and in Iran have high two meter wall, two meter tall walls. Thanks. Thanks. Now, this is the inside of Bagachel Sotun. And, and what, you do, uh, what you do see here is, is all the artwork. So Shah Abbas wanted the reflection of everything that was done. Effectively, his Shah Name was, was painted upon these walls, which are, are still there. Uh, and it is, you have, the, you have the written records. Also, you have the painted records. So like the Sistine Chapel, this was his representation. This was what he wanted to, to, to leave behind. Now, this is open to the public. And uh, I, I, had, uh, I had the fortune to, to be out there in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, I spent some time out there. And, 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 and quite surprising, everything was in pristine condition. And one of the questions that I asked, uh, how do you maintain? There are artisans that still to this day are trained in the art and that are still working on maintenance and uh, utilization of the old art in the same fashion. So they still use the mines in Ardabil they still use the same mixtures. And, and what was interesting is when I was talking to them, they, the chemical compositions, they try to maintain the same chemical compositions from the levels in arsenic to the cobalt. So everything that you, they, they try to, to reconstruct is of the original, original nature of the construction, the structure. We can go to the next if there's no actually a, qu a quick question. Yeah. Um, we often talk about how in Islam uh, figures of people um, and living creatures are usually prohibited, especially in Sunni Islam. Um, how is it that under the government of the Islamic Republic that these things are still preserved? Uh, again, this, as, as you stated before, this is really not a political or a religious course. So I'm going to interject with some of my own, uh, my own beliefs. You know, Persians by nature are not truly Islamic in mindset. So what you do see, I mean, you know, in, in Sunni Islam, any reflection or any portrait of, of uh, Muhammad or Ali or any of the Imams or is, 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 not, is not allowed by punishment of death. However, uh, most Iranians have these medallion, gold medallions that they wear, which have Muhammad on one side of it and Ali on the other side, which are actual faces representing Muhammad and Ali. Most places that you go into small uh, small uh, mosques or mausoleums, old mausoleums, you see representations of Muhammad, Ali, Hussein uh, that, are, that are there. So it is not enforced. It is not enforced because the mindset is most people don't believe it. 
if that answers your question. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah. definitely uh, yeah, it's a good perspective. And this to me was uh, I I I when I saw this myself, it was one of those uh, moments that wow, I didn't know that anything like this existed. But this, I would compare. I mean, to what I saw in the Sistine Chapel. I mean, I looking at this and look at looking at what I saw and uh, and the grandeur. It was just amazing, amazing the artwork. Uh, the ceramic work, the paintings, and the amount of time that it took to, to build, paint, and construct these. I mean, these were in tens of years until completions. So again, uh, any questions? Now, the thing to remember there is, you see the gold in here. There is a lot of gold gilding in here. So a large amount of gold has gone into the construction of these buildings, structures, paintings. Even the gold on the, on the paintings are gold paint and gold gilding. Can we go to the next, please? Now, this is uh, the Battle of Childeron and what you would see in Bagat Chel Satun. So, what the Bagat Chel Satun is a representation of, of the story of the Safavid dynasty. So, what happened, how they came about, and how they were the ups and the downs. So, it is effectively a story of what happened throughout the Safavid dynasty. And this is the Battle of Chaldaran of 1514, a representation of that, which is painted in the Baba Chel Setun. Can we go to the next, please? This was uh, one that I added uh, because I, th I think that it's sort of interesting to contrast the architecture in the capital cities with that in the periphery. So this is uh, Majmua, and this is the Ganjali Khan uh, complex, the Madmua Ganjali Khan, which is in the city of Kerman in southeastern Iran. And you can see it has the same sort of uh, central park area with a surrounding area made of workshops uh, by local uh, local artisans. And you can see um, the, uh, the work, uh, the artisan work in terms of paintings and uh, carvings in the lower right hand side. This is in the marketplace um, from the marketplace ceiling. And on the left side, you can see the bathhouses. Um, even the bathhouses were constructed ornately and in geometric patterns with, uh, with beautiful roofing and tiles. Now, if you notice this bathhouse, I've actually, I've actually been in that bathhouse. And what you will notice is there is a lot of ornate work inside of a bathhouse. And this was not the bathhouse for just the elite. So it was, it was somewhere that the, the artisans, the, the merchants also use as a bathhouse. Can we go to the next? Yeah. Um, this is the Hash Behisht, uh, which is um, uh, the, eight, the Eight Heavens. Um, and it was the palace of one of the latter uh, shahs of the Safavid Empire, that's Suleiman I, not to be confused with the Ottoman Suleiman. Uh, the Persian Suleiman basically stayed in this palace and it became his life center for the 24 years that he ruled the empire, um, or at least ruled the empire in name. And uh, you can imagine this was a retreat in every single way and uh, has it has the same kind of beautiful gardens um, that surrounded like Jahel Sutun and the same kind of um, high framing uh, work, uh, yeah. And uh, again, what you, what you will notice here is it is the revival of the Shahnameh. Again, the Shahnameh is 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 that reflection of Persian identity, which has evolved through time. But ever since the Safaviyah, the paintings, the color usage has been pretty much the same when there has been illustrations and depictions of the Shahnameh. Uh, one of the things that I will, I have, I, I will step up and if I could show you a 
representation of painting. Uh, can I, uh, Richard, is there any way that I can go on to the camera and then back? Um, it, it, your, your, your picture is dominant, but you should pull the, you should pull the painting further away from the okay. camera. Let me just keep going and a little bit to the right. Uh, other way, other way. I guess my right, your left. Perfect. Yep. Okay. What you will see, this is a new painting of a Sean Nome. I actually uh, bought this about uh, 15 years ago. And what you will see is the coloring. This is Rostam and the slaying of, uh, of a dragon. And uh, this is uh, Kermani. This is a this is a painting, which is which was commissioned much later. But what you see is the half rank, the, the painting and the colors that are used, are are pretty much the same same method, same coloring, and that is one of the things that you will see in most of uh, most of the paintings ever since the Safavid dynasty. So. Sorry, and and it is depicted in the coloring of this half rank technique. So if you look at the half rank technique, which was uh, initiated and started and really it before the Safavid dynasty, but it became prominent in the Safavid dynasty. It is continued on to today. Uh, to the next. Now, if, we, if you remember what I mentioned about the manuscripts and, and the single sheet manuscripts, this is the Safaviyat anthology, which is, uh, was, which is effectively the manuscript of, of all that happened during the Safaviyat dynasty. And what you will see is, is the gold gilding on the paintings and the writings. So this is a typical Safavia uh, era book. And uh, that's, I think, covers it uh, from my end. No, thank you so Where's much, Ram. Thanks. Okay. So we've covered the art and artistry and sort of this high level view of what Iranian society under Shah Abbas looked like. Uh, but let's take a little bit more granular look at people's lives, right? So the majority of people were not involved um, in you know, this artisanry and hard work. Most of them were peasants, right? And they lived throughout the uh, Iranian mountains, especially along the Western border with Iraq and along the Northern Caspian Sea, where the area is the greenest. And what had happened is that the Kizilbash had now begun to settle in terms of they were no longer fighting as many external enemies um, as often as, as they were fighting external enemies, but they were also, um, their territory was relatively constrained. And so they began to have Iqta or these parceled portions of land. We've seen Iqta before um, since the reign of Nizam al-Mulk uh, in Anatolia about, a thousand, about 500 years ago. But in the Persian Iqta, the Kizilbash became the lords and their peasants would work for them uh, and provide them with agricultural goods. Um, in return, the Kizilbash were supposed to fight in the Persian army and protect uh, the land that they had been given as Iqta. Um, now, of course, in terms of the larger economy, uh, we talked about the artisanry and trade that took place in Isfahan. Uh, there were also Karaban Sarai or... Um, caravan hotels, you could imagine them to be, uh, throughout the different regions. This is one from Kirman Shah, which is in the western mountains of Iran. Now, within Safavid Persia, um, especially during the reign of Shah Abbas and a little bit later, we begin to see um, differing treatment of Iran's minority communities. So I'm going to start with the Jews. Now, the Jews throughout Persian history have rel been relatively well integrated and relatively well educated as a minority category. Under Shah Abbas and especially some of the later uh, Safavid rulers, however, we begin to see this Shiite doctrine of Najis being applied to the Jews. Now Najis 
is this view that a person who has not uh, been properly ritually cleansed is filled with impurities and that these impurities can spread from person to person. Now, Jews by dint of not being Muslim, of course, would never be uh, properly purified. And so they were contaminated um, by their state of being. Jews were then required to wear certain articles of clothing, um, such as a red mark uh, to indicate that they were Jewish. Um, there are different communities where, for example, if it was raining, Jews were forbidden from going outside because the nudges could wash off the Jew and then contaminate non-Jews in the vicinity. Um, of course, this differed by uh, king to king, and it differed from city to city, such that Jews in one city might be persecuted and Jews in another city might be left alone. Um, as, as, is tip uh, as is typical of discrimination, right, we can talk about top-down discrimination, we can talk about bottom-up discrimination. This is much closer to being top-down discrimination. Um, there was certainly um, Persian views, especially um, among less educated, uh, more imam-driven regions uh, that were more anti-Semitic in this point of, in this period of time. Um, but generally speaking, um, the Persian people were more tolerant than the government would allow them to be. And these sort of, but unfortunately, these sort of traditions, because of the longevity of the Safavid state, um, have become part of the Persian Jewish experience. Now, we also have the story of the Armenians. During Shah Abbas's expansive wars, against the Ottomans. He often had to retreat. And as we've discussed uh, in previous lectures on the Ottoman side, when the Persians tend to retreat, they tend to retreat with a scorched earth method to prevent the Ottomans from having the large scale resources at these various localities to sustain their military train. Now, you had a large Armenian community in the area that's called Julfa, or Armenians call it Jugra. Um, which is today in the southern part of the Nakhchivan region of the Republic of Azerbaijan. But at this time, uh, Julfa was an um, Armenian majority city, which is why, of course, you had the Khachkars or uh, funerary tombstones of Armenians in this village until the Azerbaijani government destroyed them. So um, the when Shah Abbas was retreating in 1604 from the dominant uh, Ottoman powers, he forced all the Armenians of the village to retreat to Isfahan in the dead of winter against a river with an incredibly high current because the border between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia on the northern side and Iran on the southern side is the Aras River. So they had to cross this river. Um, many Armenians died on the trip. Um, those that survived were forcibly settled in Isfahan in an area uh, in a district called Nujulfa, which still exists. You can see in the map, in, uh, on the picture in the upper right-hand side, you can see the building that looks sort of like a mosque. That's actually the cathedral um, uh, for the Armenian church. And the Armenians have become an integral part of both Isfahan and larger Iranian society. Um, we can see here on the upper right-hand side, uh, Khachatur uh, Kesaratsi, and Kesaratsi was an Armenian living in New Julfa in that district in Isfahan. Um, and he was one of the first Iranians to use a printing press. Armenians had a distinct nature by being Christians and by having parts of the Armenian homeland split between the Ottoman Empire and the Safavid Empire, uh, the ability to travel much more easily than uh, most citizens of either empire could do. And so you had large scale trade caravans, like you can see in the, the left-hand side of Armenians bringing goods from the Karavansaray of the Western part of the Safavid Empire uh, over to the Ottoman Empire. In particular, there was a lot of silk trade that the Armenians dominated in. Um, and the Armenians, uh, to the extent that they accommodated uh, the needs of, uh, of the Shah, they were free to practice their religion. And there's still a large Christian practicing Armenian community uh, in Isfahan and uh, in the Iranian capital today of Tehran. Shah Abbas also launched wars in Georgia. Georgia was in the very difficult position of trying to decide whether it should support the Ottoman Empire or the Persian or the Safavids uh, in their wars with each other. Um, some of these kings uh, chose wisely. Some of these kings did not choose wisely. 
Um, there were demands that some of these kings convert to Islam. None of them did. Um, in particular, you have uh, King Luar Saab II, who is canonized in the Georgian Orthodox Church as a saint because he refused uh, to convert to uh, Shiite Islam. And he was imprisoned in, um, in Isfahan, uh, where he died, uh, refusing to renounce his faith. Now, in particular, these campaigns were in 1614 to 1617. And by this point, we had talked about Georgia before being this very large kingdom under David the Builder and Queen Tamar in previous, uh, in previous discussions. That Georgia had fallen apart and was now six different states, right? You had Mingrelia, Imaretia, Ajaria, uh, Tsanskhe, uh, Kartli, and Kacheti. The four Western kingdoms were much more in the Ottoman sphere. But Kartli and Kacheti, which are in that circle, uh, were the two Georgian kingdoms that fell deeply within uh, the Safavid sphere. Um, the Georgians of Kartli um, suffered their capital Tbilisi to be besieged and taken. Um, King uh, Taimuraz I um, of Kacheti uh, launched a much more serious resistance against the Persians and was thoroughly uh, lashed uh, for doing so. Um, the Safavid army entered uh, Kacheti, killed over 100,000 Georgians, de uh, deported twice that number uh, to uh, places in Iran, like Feridun Shahar, which still has a, uh, still has a large Georgian community today. Um, and the community was severely depopulated. Now, there was a goal of the Safavids to repopulate the reason, region with Kizilbash, but the Georgian kings were able to consolidate power quickly enough to prevent that eventuality while still being suzerains of the Safavids, unable to directly oppose them. Yeah, you can see in the in the upper right hand side, you have King Taimuraz the first and his wife Khorashan. Khorashan um, has often been uh, considered his greatest supporter and defender. She went to Europe on a number of occasions to plead the Georgian case, uh, generally to no avail. As we shift from Shah Abbas to his successor, uh, Shah Hussein, we have an instantiation of a Shiite clergy, which is a very interesting uh, situation historically. The prior to the Safavid state, 12 Shiite Islam had rejected, generally speaking, the institutions of the state. And it's considered itself a rebellious, non-organized entity because they considered this, the state power to generally be corrupt. So this was an, an immense reversal of fortune now with the Safavids in power that these Shiite leaders were able to concentrate and organize their own uh, governmental authority. They created their own, their own schools like the Khan Academy, you can see in the center with the tree in front of it, which is in Shiraz and it still exists to this day. Um, you also have the instantiation of national holidays and festivals that are according to the Shiite tradition, like the 10th of Muharram. This is when we begin to see the famous uh, self-lashings and flagellations that, uh, that have come to dominate sort of the Western perception of Shiites. On the 10th of Muharram, uh, Shiites will self-flagellate uh, in commemoration of their failure to assist uh, Hussein during the second uh, Islamic civil war that we discussed in the fifth lecture. Um, we also see the beginning of the formal organization and crushing of other religious sects, uh, primarily under the lead of Muhammad Bakr Majlisi. He was responsible for a number of different persecutions against every single non-Shiite minority, be it Sunnis and Sufis on the Muslim side, Zoroastrians and Hindus on the polytheistic side, and Jews and Christians on the um, uh, people of the book side. He went after all of these different minorities in different waves of persecutions and pogroms. He was also responsible for the discontinuance of filsafa, which was the Islamic doctrine of philosophy, in order to instantiate a much closer reading of Shiite Islamic uh, texts and scriptures. And it was he who really reformed the Shiite ulama or the Shiite clergy into an actual gubernatorial force that served throughout the remainder of the Ottoman Empire, uh, sorry, of the Safavid Empire as a counterweight to the, uh, the Persian bureaucrats as another uh, group of people of the Ped, right? So you have the people of the sword, the Kizilbash and the Kurchi, and you have the people of the pen, um, the Shiite bureaucrats 
and the more traditionally trained uh, Persian bureaucrats. Now, we're going to discuss this more in depth when we uh, move to the Hotakis and Afshars uh, in a few months. But at the end of this period, Iran was really besieged by all sides. Beginning in the seven, in the, around, the, around the turn of the 18th century, you had invasions from all sides. You had the Otakis coming from Afghanistan, the Balochis coming from Pakistan, uh, the uh, Arabs coming from what's now Saudi Arabia into, uh, into Iraq. You have the Lesgians uh, invading into uh, Shirvan, modern-day Azerbaijan, and you have the wars of Peter the Great that seek to expand uh, into the Caucasus region uh, at the same time. So because of all of these external forces and the poor leadership of sultans, uh, sorry, of shahs like Suleiman I, um, who really did not venture outside the walls of his own palace, the empire fell into ruin. And one of the Kizilbash leaders, um, Nadir Afshah, um, uh, sorry, Nadir Shah, uh, took power into his own hands to try and consolidate power, which again, we'll talk about when we talk about the Hotakis and the Afsharids. Um, I think that sort of covers what, uh, about the story of the Safavids. Uh, Rob, do you have anything you'd like to add or? I guess uh, the only other thing is is the siege of Esfahan by the Otakis. That uh, that was a oh, that was a time where where pretty much uh, Esfahan had had become almost uh, city of cannibals. I mean, it was it was so bad that people were eating the dead, uh, the dogs, the cats. So it is one of those periods at the end of the where uh, it, it reverted into chaos. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I guess the sad thing in a way um, is that the siege lasted so long, particularly because the Hotakis did not have the artillery to take down the walls of Isfahan. Uh, yeah, a question. The, was the language of the Safavid Empire generally Persian, and was the I guess the writing system was it was the Persian writing system. Sure, the the writing system was was Perso Arabic. the The current script of uh, of the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, would have been the same script that they were using at that time. Um, in terms of the court language under Ismail the first, uh, the dominant court language was Turkic. When we start shifting to Shah Tahmasp and his successors, we see the increasing use of Persian, such that by the point of Shah Abbas, you have both languages of uh, having equal stature. Um, and people, even the Kizilbash, right, who were Turkic by ethnicity, were were, were speaking Persian, and the Persian bureaucrats who were Persian by ethnicity were speaking Turkic. So there, uh, the both languages held an incredible amount of prestige. And when you say Turkic, I guess that's different. It's a Turkic language, but not, is it Turkish or is it Ottoman I, I, Turkish? I, I, or? I would say it's closer to the language of Azerbaijan, right? So it's- It is, yeah. is Azeri rather than Turkish. Yeah. So there is, I mean, there's commonality between Turkish and Azeri, but it is it is it is uh, Azari language that uh, that that pretty much uh, uh, we're talking about. Yeah, and the best way to understand it is to imagine sort of a continuum that goes from Istanbul in the west all the way to Kazvin uh, in the east, and you sort of have this slow change city to city, town to town of the way that Turkish is spoken. Um, if you want a parallel example, you can think of how if you drew a line from Barcelona to Lisbon, there's a slow change city to city, town to town before the standardization of the Spanish languages, right? Between Catalan and Aragonese, Aragonese to Castilian, Castilian to uh, Bable or Asturian, Asturian to Galician, Galician to Portuguese, right? You have this slow uh, change. We, had, we see the same in Turkish and that doesn't actually go away until the 20th century. Um, Ralph Seliger? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, you know, it, it, it's my mind boggles at the ethnic diversity of uh, Central Asia here. And here you have uh, two peoples I've never heard of, Lesgans and Hotakis, 
Could, could you say something about them, please? Sure. Um, the Hotakis are a tribe, so it's not an ethnicity. It's it's a tribe. They're Afghan people. Um, and uh, I believe they spoke a Turkic language, but uh, Rob, can you confirm? They also, it is it is Turkic as well as they speak uh, what, what you would call Dari today. So they speak both a Persian dialect as well as a Turkic dialect. Um, the Lesgians are a Caucasian people. Um, they've existed in the region that we now call Azerbaijan and the parts of Russia that border it, like the Republic of Dagestan and Ingushetia, um, for thousands of years. Um, and when we talk, for example, about the Caucasian Albanians, we're talking about a Lesgian state. The Lesgian just happened to be the ethnicity um, or the linguistic group, perhaps is better to say, um, of the people who we call the Caucasian Albanians. Uh, the, the other thing about the Lesgians is there is so inter, so much intermarriage between the Lesgians and the Azaris that they are now effectively the same. They are the same people. Yes. Uh, actually, it's interesting. Uh, you know, from Soviet Union, they had actually had a, a dance called Lesginka, which means <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it comes from the Lesgian, yeah, yes. Lesgian. And uh, if you guys want to hang around. Or if you guys want, I can put a YouTube video of the dance. It's pretty amazing. Um, you know. I was gonna say let's let's first see if there are any additional questions, comments, concerns yeah, before course. we uh, before we watch that. I'll find it first. I guess people want to see the video. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, right. Richard. No. I, hey, look, I'm fine with that. Let's uh, do it. I'm joking. I'm joking. Of course. Uh, uh, and 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 thank and thank you everybody for the for the nice comments. Um, I do read them. Uh, it's just that since they weren't asking a question, I didn't I didn't add them to the discussion. But uh, yeah, thank you, Mikhail, for the nice words, uh, as well as um, yeah, some of the others. So uh, I'm gonna put the well. This is at the game, but uh, I just wanna. Well, um, thanks a lot, Richard and, and Rob. Great presentation. Very interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Excellent presentation. Thank yeah. you, Kobe. All right, thank you, everybody. And of course, come back next week when uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Ar Armenian history up until uh, this period with Shah Abbas. So the, the most commonly is dance between a man and a woman. So uh... Uh, more to Ralph Seliger's uh, sort of question about who the Lesgians are, you can see from uh, their physical aspect, right, that they are a Caucasian people, right? They're they're darker than Russians, but sort of lighter in skin tone than you would think of a typical Middle Easterner. Um, and that's exactly what you would expect. Well, I thought most Iranians are, are, are Indo-European, aren't they? Yes, Iranians are Indo-European uh, from a linguistic sense um, and from a genetic sense as well. Um, mm -hmm the the diff the difference is that of course Iranians are darker in the same way that Italians are darker than Scandinavians right mm -hmm. um, uh, 
But uh, of course, uh, as you can see, this recording is made by Russians. So my intuition is that this is taking place inside of Russia, where lesbians are still a recognized minority by the Russian government. So uh, do watch this. <laughs> I'm going to do watch this online if you guys want. But Rob and Richard was amazing. Really good. Uh, Rob, thank you mm -hmm. for the uh, archeolo ar architectural standpoint and uh, other definitely good points. And Richard, thank you for the, putting an overall perspective to this. And uh, if you guys want to see the upcoming schedules, I uh, just wanted to share it pretty, quick, pretty quickly if you're interested um, of what things things are coming up uh, uh before, before you did that i wanted to actually right. ask um upcoming in february are two presentations one on uh the russo-turkish wars and one on balkan nationalism um given the number of russians in this group um uh, i wanted to sort of leave it open if if any of you wanted to collaborate with me of course if you see anything in the list of things that I'm doing that you want to collaborate on, you're more than free, but I just wanted to point to those two um, specifically because um, of the knowledge in this group um, as, as concerns those kinds of things. Yeah, I'll, I'll also ask, uh, I don't know, Greg is not in today, but I can ask Greg as well. Yeah, so wait, wait, wait. Um, if you stay there for a second. Yeah. Because you can see my, uh, so I can, do, I can do my schedule. And so you can see, I sort of have a plan uh, that takes us to the end of time. Um, and obviously this is all up to discussion, debate, or um, what, uh, so if you guys have ideas, comments, you want to join me in on doing one of these presentations, um, I would love to uh, alter this in any way that makes it better fit this group and better fit our skill sets. Um, so, and if you see something in here that uh, you think is interesting that you want to do, please talk to me. Um, but yeah, so the general trajectory is to talk about the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire and occasionally talk about uh, Persia as uh, as a side point. Um, and the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, some of that will take place in Europe, some of that will take place in the Middle East. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so um, Saturday, uh, this Saturday, we're actually going to be talking about sexuality in ancient Rome. You know, if anybody's offended, you know, don't don't come. <laughs> but if you're interested, we're not going to talk anything like uh, gross. But we will do. We will talk about Pompeia. Basically, I'll, I'll compare the ancient Rome to ancient Greece and ancient Egypt. So that would be interesting aspect of it. Then Paul is going to talk about uh, Gracchi, which is an important senatorial uh, family. Um, and uh, we will finish it up. Um, well, we're going to talk about slavery in Rome in February and so forth, so on. Alternative histories, we also, on 130, will have the libraries that are being destroyed, Ashurbanipal, Alexandria. And then Lisa is going to present on 210. And I don't know, Richard, are you still uh, stepping in with Lisa? Yeah, can... uh, the, two of, the two of us are, are going to do that presentation together. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back with her and uh, put you together. We're doing second intermediate. Period. Oh no, we we we've already started talking. We're, uh, she's done most of her slides actually. She's oh, very wow. industrious. Yeah, and then that will kind of kick off. Maybe on Sundays we'll do Egyptian theme uh, from the beginning of Egyptian, uh, you know, uh, Egypt creation of Egypt and so forth, so on. Then I'm still looking for uh, a presenter. Alex kind of dropped off on uh, Qing Dynasty and Warring States, but. Maybe I'll take the one on and I'll help if somebody wants to step up, help me out. Um, and then uh, European history, Richard just went through um, some of his- No, we, 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 no we didn't do European Union history. Um, European Union history is a different series um, that Aaron and I have been working on. It's about once a month, um, usually on the third or fourth, uh, yeah, the third Sunday of the month. Um, and that series um, will be, uh, first we did in December, the history of the European Union from 1946 to 2000. We're going to finish that and cover uh, 2000 to the present as well as institutions um, on Sunday the 23rd. Uh, we're, uh, in the following months, we're going to talk about institutions, the legal functioning, um, sort of putting all this information together, and then talking about several political crises. Excellent. And uh, we have our literature piece, uh, which is going to be Marcus Aurelius. 
And then if uh, COVID, well, we also have this uh, Q&A type of section talk about martial arts on 120, if anybody interested, or history of Soviet Union versus USA in sports. And if anybody interested, obviously it's COVID right now, but uh, 226, uh, come and commemorate what Richard is talking about, medieval Armenia. I want to kind of go, if anybody wants to come, uh, if not, I'll cancel. Uh, we'll do a little Armenian cafe uh, on 250 Hancock Street in Brooklyn on 226. I'll still post it online if anybody interested. That's going to be next month. Maybe Omnicron will subside. Maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> um, it, it depends on how things are. But I do want to uh, go to the Armenian cafe after Richard presents on uh, uh, medieval Armenia. Uh, that's it. Again, thank you, Richard, again. Thank you, uh, Rob, again. Thank you, everybody, for great questioning. Uh, any kind of last-minute thoughts, questions, uh, let us know. If not, we'll, um, we'll split until this Saturday or next week, uh, wh whoever's preference to come to whatever. And Rob, we, we do definitely want to see you back. Thank you. <laughs> You're a, no, Rob, it was fantastic. I, I really yeah. appreciate working with you. Thank Great you. presentation, guys. It was awesome. Yeah, thank you so yes, much. Thank you much. Yep, and I'll uh, see you. Uh, and then, Richard, by the way, on 115, they're going to repeat the uh, the Islam 101. Uh, and there's going to be, well, presumably, there's going to be about 300 people on it. So, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, if you would like to, um, I'll send you a link. It's on the, uh, uh, in, in, in the Roberts group. Sure. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, uh, uh, send me send me a link. Um, uh, Zach? Yeah. You got Sula's Civil Wars for 4-2. Um, yeah. That kind of segues into uh, in, into the Parthians and Carhays. Oh, is it? So I'm uh, willing to take that one. Correct. Sort of segues into uh, process. Okay, so I'll put you in. Um, mm -hmm. I am also looking for presenters on Roman history. So Howard been stepping up. Thank you so much. Uh, if anybody wants to talk about anything, you know, Judea, the uh, mm. Vespasian attack of and destruction of Second Temple by Titus, you know, mm. anything like that, you know, uh, and Howard took on Parthian War. And um, so let me just present back if anybody interested in any kind of subject matters here that mm. would like to present, uh, I'm more than welcome. Uh, because you're kind of like me so far, <laughs> you, me and uh, Paul and Greg and now Howard stepping up and uh, presumably mm -hmm. Sergio is going to talk about an Roman army. We had a good presentation last week, but we'll talk about the uh, Roman army again on 219. If anybody wants any of this social war, rise of Marius, right, the uh, important uh, Roman army is set up, uh, Latin language and literature in Republic Rome, you know, Minna's doing it, but I don't know if she hadn't been in contact for a while, but Spartacus and Third Civil War. Anybody wants to do Spartacus or First Triumvirate? You know, Pompey, uh, Cross, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Crassus and Caesar and stuff like that. Uh, so I guess if you want, just email me or whenever I send the schedule and you want to step up and take the subject matter, let me know. And I can always have, like with Richard, if anybody wants to step up and do something with Richard, like Aaron is doing a bunch of stuff with Richard on Russo-Turkish Russo wars and uh, whatnot, but uh, would be interesting to also. Yeah, I, I think some of the ones where people might find the easiest crossovers, for example, if you look, um, I'm going to talk about the Mamluk rule in Egypt, and that gets uh, and that has a lot to do with Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. So if you want to come at it from the Napoleon side, I'd really appreciate uh, if somebody had that kind of expertise. Um, or if, um, if somebody wants to uh, look at, you know, Syria or um, somebody who's very strongly affiliated with Turkey and wants to talk about the Turkish War of Independence, um, you know, there, there's a lot of places where I, I have a lot to say, but I think that a lot of other people bring unique and fresh perspectives to this because of their sort of orientation and, and, and presence. So. Yeah, it would be awesome. Uh, and again, thank you, everybody. And uh, I wish everybody a nice evening and a happy new year again. And happy if anybody is celebrating Orthodox New Year, happy Orthodox New Year coming up. Um, uh, talk to you soon. Yeah, thank I you think guys. that's it. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Good night.